Requesting connection. Established. Encrypted. We're live. The show you've been asking for. Advice, technology, and community. Linux first, all others second. This is Ask Noah. Live. Multispeed Technologies, the Ask Noah show starts right now. This is the show where we came to do all the things on Linux they said couldn't be done and take your questions on how to do the same. The phone lines are open this hour to be a part of the program. It is a free call. 1-855-450-NOAH. That's 1-855-450-6624 or send an email to live at asknoahshow.com. My name is Noah July. I am your host. Delighted to be here with you as another episode of the Ask Noah Show kicks off this hour. Joining me, my co-host, Mr. Steve Ovens. Welcome in, sir. Good evening, Noah. Do you mind if I uh, ask the audience a question? Ask away. So, dear audience, I have a puzzler for you. So I have access points. So my, my entire network is segregated into VLANs and uh, there's a specific access point or uh, SSID that connects to the VLAN that my desktop sits on. When I try to access a web service that is on the same VLAN with a Wi-Fi client, it gets part of the way, but never actually loads the rest of the, the site. But hmm. when I use it from a wired connection, it works immediately. Also, if the wireless connector actually has tail scale turned on so that I, I am somehow rooted back into my network at the PFSense level, which is my router, it can then access the website as normal. And I just thought, you know what? This one is kind of got me scratching my head. I thought I'd ask for some help and see if the audience happens to have some tips as to where or how they might go about tracking down this issue. Somebody will know the answer. They'll have it for you. Steve, would you like to hear about the issue that I couldn't track down this week? Absolutely. Don't host your email, they said. Hand it off to a third party, they said. They'll solve all your problems, they said. All you have to do is log into your DNS provider and point your MX records for your entire domain to us, and we will take care of everything. Until it doesn't work, in which case we'll hand it right back to you and tell you to fix your own problem. So I have this organization this week. They're on Office 365, hosted Microsoft email account. One would think that your business is safe with Microsoft. They got a big name. They've been around a while. The ticket comes into me as I can't reach this person with this email, which happened to be a Yahoo email. Within a few moments of looking into it, we quickly discover and arrive at the problem that this entire organization cannot send emails to anybody with an at yahoo.com email address. All right, well. Blacklists, I check all the normal things to check, can't find any problems. So I start Googling. And I come across a forum post in which multiple users reference having this particular issue of having entire domains, specifically Yahoo, with an inability to speak with their clients and or their users if they're the ones administrating an Office 365 subscription. I get to the end of whatever page that happens to end on, and the end conclusion is Microsoft really doesn't know why the problem exists, and they don't really know how to fix it, and not one person in that entire thread says, oh, Microsoft helped me, and here's what they told me to do, and it fixed my problem. Plenty of, like, they told me to do this, I tried, it didn't work. Plenty of, hey, the problem just went away after a little bit. None of, here was the problem, here was the root cause, here's how we fixed it. So I go and explain to the organization leadership, hey, this is kind of the boat we're in. They said, will you please open up a ticket anyway? And I thought, all right, I kind of know what to expect here because others have trudged this path before me and they were unsuccessful. I have no belie- reason to believe that I will be any more successful than they. So I opened my ticket. That was on Wednesday at two o'clock. Today at around two o'clock, after going back once or twice with a few days in between and sending error messages and all the things that you would expect to do, I get an email back. Yeah, we don't really know why this is happening and we'll continue to work on it. Please be patient. Steve, they've been without their email to Yahoo. Do you have any idea how disruptive it is to an organization to tell an organization, hey, you just can't email this entire domain. And oh, by the way, it happens to be a provider that's quite popular with people that sign up for free email addresses and you just can't reach them. I mean, part of me goes, who's using Yahoo anymore? <laughs> <laughs> the people that didn't I, jump jump in Google in Office 365, that's who. 
I guess I didn't know. I you know this is sort of tongue in cheek, but I didn't know that Yahoo was still a thing. They're very much still a thing. So I think there's actually a connection there to AT and T somehow. But all this got me thinking, and I started to have conversations with the boys at AltaSpeed to say, "Hey, I just." I can't quite square this in my head. We're told to sign up for this subscription service. We're told that this is going to be the better mousetrap. And yet when there's a problem, I can show you the emails of Microsoft support telling me, hey, here's how you log into the Office Admin 365 portal. And here's how you run a message trace. And here's how you look at the airman. Well, I got all that. I did all that before I reached out to you. The problem is I've now hit a point in my troubleshooting process by which I can't go any further because I don't have any more information to go off of. And even if I did, I don't have control over any of the levers that it would require to fix this problem. So I'm going to need your assistance. And less, and they're just, they're, they're nowhere to be found. So I start digging back into mail in the box. I have to tell you, now it's early days, right? I'm going to get the setup on my own domain. I'm going to try a very limited production run with some client stuff to see how it works. But based on what I know today, mail in the box is incredibly straightforward and simple to set up. Read, you download a bash script and run it and wait. Then you log into the web UI. If you're willing to do what everybody else seems to be willing to do, that is just point DNS at. If you're willing to do that, mail in the box will set up everything. If you're not willing to do that, they have a custom way to, to do it and you can step through and configure various parts of your DNS. But on the other side, what you wind up with is a mail server, a mail client, an easy to administrate web interface for creating users and doing all the things, self-hosted, open source, all the check marks down. I tell you what, Steve, I'm not sitting here tonight, January the 23rd and saying, yeah, you know how Steve and Noah were in lockstep agreement that hosting your mail is a bad idea. I'm not quite ready to say I'm ready to leave that camp, but I'm looking outside of the boat, Steve, and I'm looking over to the self-hosters over there and I'm looking at their island and I'm asking myself, am I in any better of a boat? Because right now I don't feel like I'm in any better of a boat. I mean, you are because you can get blame deferral. It's not actually your problem at this point. They so, can be mad at Microsoft. It's hilarious you say that because here I'm going to pull up. So the exact email I sent, subject line, Microsoft Yahoo update, and then in parentheses, there is no update, dot, dot, dot. Good afternoon. I wanted to keep you in the loop with the case with Microsoft. After six days, please see the latest from Microsoft and then the person from Microsoft's name who's been assigned to our case. I'll continue to update as this case and the resolution progresses. And then I link the, hi, sorry about the delay. Please allow some more time and we'll get back to you. Six days in. So you're right. I guess to the extent that my, my interest is the CMA or making sure that, hey, if there's anything I could do, I'd be doing it. But at this point, what I'm what I'm what I'm begrudgingly arriving at is it's just the nature of my being. When somebody says, Noah, help me, I have this problem, I want to go fix it and I want to do that, or I want to find somebody that can. And right now, I feel ham hamstrung using what I'm told is the industry gold choice. Seems like a seems like they got some work to do. You can only do as much as you can do, though. And then I'm sure you've got other problems that you can go solve. I do. And if I didn't have other problems, you know what I'd do? I'll dig into the email box and I'll find some problems from users. Our first email comes in tonight from Charlie. Charlie writes in and says, G'day, everyone. I came across this project, Zigbee from Firmware. Zigbee Home Firmware Project aims to provide similar functionality to ESP Home open source firmware, but for Zigbee devices based on Nordic semi NRF52 wireless microcontrollers and later newer NRF53 MCUs. The firmware relies on the Nordic Semi ZBoss for Zigbee 3.0 stack and should eventually enable a range of Zigbee devices to be flashed with open source firmware and facilitate integration with Home Assistant open source home automation frameworks through the ZHA integration and support for Zigbee 2 MQTT. It's also being worked up. He links to the source code at github.com and the news post from cnx-software.com, both of which we'll have linked for you in the show notes. So, Steve, let me ask you, point blank, why do I care about Zigbee firmware? I mean, I don't. Uh, no, but uh, You've really sold it to me. Yeah, right. Well, I mean, I have a long storied history. Who knows? Maybe the open source Zigbee firmware would actually resolve some of my issues, but I doubt it because um, that seems to be more 
on. Well, I don't think it's the devices, though. When I lose basically half my network, I have a hard time believing that 17 devices all simultaneously failed. I yeah. feel like the problem is deeper than that. However, I mean, at the point, that's like saying, well, I have a an integration with this one thing that runs locally, or I could put open source software on it. So for example, the Roomba has a local integration that you can talk to it on, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean that they couldn't push an update to turn that off at some point. Yes. Now the Zigbee stuff is highly, highly unlikely that that's going to happen, but why would you put open source firmware on there? Cause you can. I like it. I like that people have an option. I'll be honest with you. Just, having a conversation with you and multiple conversation with you is enough to scare the bejeebers out of me of ever going the Zigbee route. Like if somebody tells me like, Oh, I got it dialed in. You use this controller and you use this light switch and you pair it like this and you get it all running and it works great. If I ever hear that from somebody, I'll reconsider that stance. But at the moment I have to fall down on the Z wave side, just, from, just, just by the nature of being connected to you and living vicariously through your home <laughs> automation and its problems. I don't want to bring those into my life. Well, I mean, I have I have tried a lot and I'm not I know technically you inept, but <laughs> I mean there's plenty of people out there that seem to have this stuff working, so I I don't know what it is. Yeah, I just if you can't tell me Well, like I say, so to that end, when one of those people emails the show or calls me or stops me on the street or buys me a hamburger or whatever it is and says, Hey, I got it all dialed in, here's a secret recipe, here's what you do. If that ever happens, I'll reconsider the stance. Until then, I'm I'm I don't know. I'm, I'm in on Z. My foot is in the Z Wave camp at the moment. Our third email comes in from Steve. Steve says, Hi there. I'm looking for recommendations on vulnerability scanning software or services that will run, scan a server and looking for known vulnerabilities or misconfigurations. The type of server that will be scanned would predeterminately Linux would be predominantly Linux servers running public facing services, mostly web services, but other things too. The servers are virtual machines running a VMware enterprise environment for which I am the system administrator. We are wanting to be a bit more proactive in terms of finding and correcting vulnerabilities. I'm open to software as a service or solutions or self-hosted solutions. Open source is great, but not strictly required. Free is good, but also not strictly required. Thanks, Steve. So Steve, you deal, Steve, the host, not Steve, the listener, you deal with at least being aware of vulnerabilities and the necessary patching procedures for maintaining them, what do you see? So the vast majority of uh, clients or client adjacent companies that I have, that I am aware of use open S cap and it's an open source framework. It's primarily designed for Linux, but it basically it can scan things. It follows the, the NIST standard, um, which if you're writing and asking about vulnerabilities, you probably know what that is. And it also plugs into other other tools such as Claire. So Claire is a similar tool for scanning containers, for example. Mm. And it gives you a CVE and the severity score and how compliant you are. And there are a bunch of tools that wrap around it so that, for example, uh, we have clients that, that scan software before it gets installed on a system and you can set up policies such that it will not let that software be installed if it does not meet the minimum, like has to have medium severity or lower, for example. Okay. So there's there's lots of pluggability in Open SCAP. It's, it is enterprise software. It is not, I double click on a thing <laughs> and I have magic happen. So... That's my disclaimer. It's it's uh, it's a bit of a chore to to set up to get it to do those types of things, but that is absolutely what most of what I see happens. So uh, I'll answer this question two different ways. So the first way I'll answer it is what I would do today if a, if 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 you Steve the client came to me and said Noah, I want you to set a thing up and I want to be aware of vulnerabilities and what's going on in my system. I would I would suggest checking out Wazoo, W A Z U H, and and effectively what it does. It's a lot more than just vulnerability scanning. A lot more, but 
largely what it does is you install the agent or the client and there's ways to evaluate things that don't have an agent and a client. So I'll get into that in a second. But you install the agent or a client and it, it effectively reports in and says, here's a list of the known CVEs. Here's the ones that are here. Here's the effective machine. Here's the resolution. The thing that I like about Wazoo is it can be active. So you can tell it. I'll give you an example. We had a we had a client that had has Wazoo monitoring and it flagged a bunch of machines and said, they're using Firefox of this particular version and it has this problem. We call the client, hey, did you know? Yeah, we don't use Firefox. We don't really care. Can you just take it off the computers? Okay, great. No problem. But, and so in that case, you know, we did it by hand. But you could set it up to say, hey, you come across this. This client doesn't use Firefox. So if you ever come across a machine that's ruined their system and it has Firefox, kill it. Just take it off. You can also do things like, hey, you see a vulnerability or you see somebody actively exploiting a thing, shut that machine down. The machine comes back on, shut the network connection down. Network comes back up, shut the switch down and just start killing stuff and hammering stuff. And meanwhile, firing alerts off to let me know what's happening until a human being can get involved and fix it. But it works towards this XDR or, or, or sim, uh, I, I guess, process of trying to be proactive to threat response as opposed to reactive, which is becoming an increasing re requirement. Um, from places that are demanding XDR. So so that's one thing I'd put on your radar, Wazoo, especially if you're managing anything of any particular size, because you can automate the entire process. And then your process as a system administrator is make sure it's enrolled in monitoring and the monitoring will take care of the rest of it. And if we can, we'll automate the solution of fixing the security vulnerability before it comes to fruition. The second thing I would draw to your attention, now granted this information might be a bit out of date because it's been like 10 years since I've been through certi certified eth ethical hacking. But back then, they walked through a basically a stage of penetration testing and or performing ethical hacking, planning and recognizance, learning about what's there. Well, you don't have to do that because you're employed by the organization. So you know what, or at least you should know what's all in your environment. Scanning is the second step. Now, typically scanning is tools that you use to understand the target. So you, this is where you would look for vulnerabilities and this is where you would start to evaluate them. And then lastly is, or not lastly, but the next step would be gaining access, then maintaining access and then analysis and configuration. So basically going through and making sure that you're, you're, you're covering your track, so to speak. The tool that they had suggested for us for scanning and gaining access was Metasploit. And Metasploit is a fantastic little piece of open source software. And what I like about it is it's a system or a framework rather that goes out and says, what are all of the known vulnerabilities? And then lists them out for you as you scan a client, you can right click on that client and say, use that vulnerability or demonstrate that or whatever it is that you need to do either to show your boss or see that it actually works or see if you're actually vulnerable to it, whatever the reason is it gives you a nice little UI uh, that you're able to do some of that stuff in. So I'd put that on your radar, something to be aware of. And then um, Sleuth in the chat room at uh, geeklab.ninja uh, gave a, a, a plug for something called Linus, L-Y-N-I-S. And I'll have a link for you in the show notes, podcast.asknoahshow.com. I haven't personally used it myself, but I think this would be... a I think this would be a really, uh, really cool way to uh, to check out. Um, Steve, anything to add or anything that I anything that I missed? Uh, not that you missed, but I didn't. So I didn't know you were going to talk about was that, and I just kind of dug through the documentation. It's Open SCAP based. Oh, so, is it? Yeah, I put so a couple using links it, and in I don't even show, know. Nate, show notes there um, under how it works. You can see that the, in the URL, it's policy monitoring slash open SCAP, how it works dot HTML. Fantastic. So it's right in their user manual. Well, here's what's great about it, Steve, as like, so, it, it, so, so let me see. I think we're going to be on the same page on this one, but would our shared collective advice be use the individual tool like open SCAP to learn the tool, understand its limitations, understand how it works, then move to a larger, more complex implementation of the tool if you want to do so to automate parts of the process. The idea or the rationale being that if push comes to shove, you always have the opportunity to go back to doing it by hand. Yeah, and definitely slide between different tools that might use it as a base. 100%. Uh, our next email comes in from Mike. Mike writes in and says, I recall getting messages on my Ubuntu 22.04 machine that say that I can upgrade to Ubuntu Pro to provide updates to certain packages. Based on my research online, it appears that this is abso not absolutely necessary for a home user. 
In fact, my understanding is that the Ubuntu team is providing their own security patches for certain packages now. If I elect not to participate in Pro, I assume that I would still be receiving the normal package maintainers updates as I always have been before. Am I understanding this correctly? I've enjoyed the Linux experience thus far because I've never needed to register an identity to my installation. While it appears that the Pro service adds an additional layer of security, it also involves breaking this model. This brings back flashbacks to a previous OS I've not used in years that was notorious for spying on its users and giving them blue screens of death. Thanks for all you do, Mike. So, I guess a couple of things here, Steve. First of all, do you have any experience with Ubuntu Pro or any thoughts for Mike? I, I've looked at Ubuntu Pro, honestly. I've thought about the Ubuntu Advantage for the, the handful of VMs that I have. Uh, my NAS is running Ubuntu, for example. So I've definitely considered it. I, I hadn't considered the idea that I'm giving identity data away. Mm. Um, that's an interesting angle. I hadn't considered that. I have to think about that. I currently do not have any subscriptions or uh, utilize any of those types of services. So I'll... I'll work backwards. I'll start with the identity thing. If you want privacy, of course, don't sign up for a service. In fact, I would go as far as to say is if you're concerned about privacy, don't pay for anything. And if you're going to pay for something, pay with it with some sort of cryptocurrency. But the second you tie payment information, you've you've given up that card. They're going to know who you are because anti-money anti laundering laws are a thing. And so if you're entering into a business relationship and sending money, they want to know who you are. It's plain as that. So to your privacy point, I agree. If you want to maintain your privacy and uh, anonymity, I, I probably wouldn't sign up for Ubuntu Pro as well. To your question about when do you get updates. So Ubuntu Pro is, well, let me start here. So the typical way that this works is a vulnerability is discovered. It's brought to the developer's attention behind closed doors. It's called responsible disclosure. So the idea is that we don't go out on the open internet and go, hey, everybody, I found out that if I do this, I can get it. We don't do that. You go directly to the software maintainer. You go directly to the organization and say, hey, came across this thing. This looks like it's pretty severe. What do you want to do about it? That gives that company enough time to go fix the thing. Now, if it's a larger problem, sometimes you'll have responsible disclosure to a number of different entities because that allows companies or other people, maybe you need multiple teams working on it, or you have multiple companies that are involved, or maybe there's something that's so severe and there are certain places that are out there that need to get something in place, but it doesn't make any sense to make it public knowledge until we have a way to fix it, right? Otherwise we're doing more harm than good. So responsible disclosure dictates that we go to the developer or the maintainer or the company first and say, hey, here's what we found, do you wanna fix it? They fix it, then they release the update, then there's an announcement. Hey, there's a CVE. Hey, that's a really big deal. Hey, there's an update to fix it. And then everybody is allowed to do that. What Ubuntu Pro promises is that when those CVEs come out, it obviously it takes a hot minute for that process to work out. So if I come out tomorrow and say, hey, we got a new version out and uh, it has a CVE, but we got a fix in place and all you got to do is update. Well, sure. After I've tested it with my production application and the dev team and checked with operations and went over to DevOps, made sure that they don't have any problems with it. And I guess they were rolling a new version of Whatchamajigit over there. And so we're going to have to do the diddly d Yeah. Somewhere around 30 to 60 to 90 days later, we'll know where all the chips have fallen. We'll have had a chance to communicate with all the people. The update will come out. It will get downloaded to your system. Life will go on. Thank you, Linux and open source. What if that model doesn't work for you? What if you're the kind of organization that has a target painted, like a bright red target painted on your back, and when a CVE hits the public internet, you want the fix right now? Then what do you do? Ubuntu Pro. They will reduce that CVE exposure time. That is to say, the day that it comes out on the internet till the time that the fix is actually available in your distro and you can install it, they will take that time from 98 days down to a single day, which both Steve and I thought was pretty dang impressive. Yeah, I... Uh... I know what kind of work can go into that, at least tangentially, and uh, that is quite the lift. I'm I'm impressed that that is a commitment that they're sticking to. So here, here's what I would tell you. I would tell you that if you want to give it a shot, Ubuntu Pro is free for up to five machines. Okay, so if uh, and then I think if you're an official Ubuntu community member, then I think they give you up to fifty machines. So. One option is you could consider the advantages of becoming a, a, a member or getting a membership to um, the Ubuntu community, and I will have a link for that in the show notes for you. 
But the second thing is to answer to answer your question most directly, like how do you make that choice or when is it worth it? You be the judge of that. How fast do you need the updates? Will you eventually get them? Yes. Do you need them quicker than the average person? If that's the case, I would strongly consider getting an Ubuntu Pro thing. And if it's free for up to five users or 50 if you're a community member, I mean, presumably you should be able to sign up under a fake name. I'm not necessarily suggesting that you commit identity theft, so obviously don't violate any laws, pay attention to proceed carefully, as it were. But again, if you can stay away from payment, you got a fighting chance. So that might be able, you might be able to have your, your lunch and eat it too. If that doesn't answer your question, Mike, give us a call back or email back in and uh, we'll love to, t we'd love to take a look at it. David writes in and says, I signed up for Sophos XG for home and I use it to control network activities like gaming or YouTube for my kit. Sorry, it's not open source, but it works. It's VPN isn't for me and WireGuard needs to be allowed if you restrict potential apps from the network. I do believe it can block encrypted DNS over the network and that could bypass DNS restriction also. I've had a single AP, a Zysil NWA210AX, delivering all of our Wi-Fi. It has the ability to separate each SSID into a separate VLAN. I have devices isolated and restricted the speed to 50 megs. The IoT is at half a meg. So far, the Sophos has been more stable than PFSense or OpenSense. It's an old, it's in an old Dell R310 server with 32 gigs and 500 gig SSD, two terabytes of Rust mirrors. I have many services like Nextcloud, Sophos XG, a Minecraft server, Chasm, and other little containers that one for Tailscale. I want to break Sophos off into its own device, not really for performance, but because sometimes daddy breaks down the Proxmox server and everything goes down. Yes, daddy is me. Not fun to hear my wife and son ask what's wrong with their internet. I'm looking also to go with Linux on my Asus Zephyrus GL4 with a 3060 graphics card. What would be a good start? So far, 90% of my Linux has been Debian-based. Thanks, David. So... I need to call the elephant out in the room. If you've listened to previous, not you, David, but if you, the audience, have listened to other episodes of the show, you've heard me recommend Sophos. I want to be abundantly crystal, crystal clear here. I am not talking about Sophos, the software. I am talking about Sophos, the hardware appliance. And I don't, I strip Sophos, the software, off of their appliance because at the end of the day, it's just a little Intel computer. Now, that's applicable to David's question insofar as if you're looking for a dedicated piece of hardware to run Sophos routing appliance, may I suggest the Sophos routing appliance because they're amazing little pieces of hardware. And if and when you ever do hit the point where you're like, yeah, you know what? Sophos isn't cutting it for me anymore. I kind of want to go back to OpenSense or PFSense. Well, it's just an Intel board. So you just plug a USB drive in, reinstall, and Bob's your uncle. It's interesting that you're, you're struggling with the Dell R310. I would think that has way more than enough horse get up and go to be able to to do this for you. So I guess I'm a bit surprised. S Steve, any thoughts for David? I don't think that it's an issue with the R310 having um, having not enough oomph to do what he wants. Okay. I think the issue is uh, daddy tinkers and tinkering breaks. <laughs> and since the internet is on top of the tinkering box, the internet goes down. Everybody is. Everybody has a development box. Some of us are fortunate enough to have one that's separate from our production box. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Um, aside from that, addressing the idea of a laptop, or well, this happens to be a laptop, mm. a distro for a laptop. Mm -hmm. I I personally would go with. I assume that this one is. So I looked it up, and there are various models, like versions of this model. So I couldn't tell whether like what exactly, whether it had integrated graphics or not. Like there's an AMD chip, but some of them have integrated graphics and some of them don't and so on. Um, there is a uh, a utility out there that helps you switch between the NVIDIA and the integrated graphics card. I have it on my wife's laptop, which is running Ubuntu Mate because it's got the nice widget built right into it. Uh, I like Mate. If you're if you're Debian based, I probably would stick with a Debian base. Maybe depends how fancy you want to be. If you like the really fancy, you could go with something like elementary OS. You could go with straight up Debian or you could go with one of the flavors. It depends. You didn't give us much information as to what you're trying to do or whether you have a preferred desktop or whatever. Not that you can't switch out your desktop environment, but 
it might be better. Like if you if you really like KDE, it's probably not a good idea to install main Ubuntu and then put KDE on top of it just because you should just go with the distro that's spinning that, that desktop for you. So uh, I'd like it if you wrote back in and gave us a little more detail on what it is that you like, or maybe you don't know. And then, you know what, call in and mm. we'll have a good chat about it. 100%. So I, I would start here, you, and you touched on it, elementary OS. I It takes a lot these days to impress me. It really does. In part because I, it's just, in a lot of ways, I feel like stuff is getting worse, right? Like I use the newest version of Windows, and I'm like, what in the bajee? I, used, I sat down for Windows 11, and it took me a good long while to figure out how in the world do I set up Windows 11 without having to have an internet connection and create a Microsoft account because they want you to have an internet connection and uh, create a Microsoft account. And it turns out there is a way to pass it. Uh, when you're sitting, as soon as the computer boots up, you hit hold shift, press F10, and then type OOBE slash bypass NRO. And if you do that, it will restart the wizard and then it won't require an internet connection, won't require you to make a Microsoft account. So that's great. But it's one of those things where I would tell you that's a regression. I would tell you that we're going backwards from what I'm interested in in an operating system. And so every time I use something, I'm like, wow, here's the shortcomings, here's the shortcomings, here's the shortcomings. And to be fair, Linux has them too. You, know, you give me the distro and I'll tell you where the bones are buried. However, elementary OS stands out for one reason, polish. Everything is dialed into the T's. I mean, they decked it out to the nines. They have anticipated, it is, it is what you would expect as a stock operating experience out of a box. Now, when you want to do more with it than what they anticipated you were going to do out of the box, then you got to get down and dirty and hack. But that's the good part about being open source. At the end of the day, it's Debian underneath. So a really excellent polished experience out of the box, ability to tweak and dig in when you like, and an Ubuntu base. So that's one option. Personally, I'm still a Kubuntu user. I've yet to find something I've asked Kubuntu to do that it doesn't do. I've yet to find somebody who wants to make a change, customize, change, modify the way it works can't do that, works fine there. And again, you've got that solid Ubuntu base underneath. I would tell you that if you're looking to branch out a little bit, that's where I would start to look at something like Arch. Now, Steve will tell you, you Steve, you're still a, like an actual Arch guy. Like go raw dog it, read the Arch wiki, learn how to build it, do it. It doesn't take as long as you think. Yeah, I mean, there's, I suppose there's nothing more to say than that. <laughs> I'm lazy, so I use Endeavor OS because I just want an installer and I want to click through and put check boxes along packages and then have it show up. But either of those two, what I would tell you is you're going to get the best hardware compatibility using something like Arch. Literally, and I was telling Steve last week, I can't remember if it was on the air or off the air, but it's got become one of those things that I take that flash drive, I stick it in, and it doesn't matter what the hardware is, it probably is going to work. So it gives you maximum hardware flexibility. Where you're going to struggle is... I don't even necessarily know that this is Arch's fault. It's just the nature of being on the bleeding edge. You're going to find out what things are out of date or what things don't work first before anybody else does. I'll give you an example. GTK Pod, one of the most brilliant little applications ever written in the history of man. It has since turned into a library that's been in, that's been incorporated in things like Rhythmbox and uh, what's the one that's based off of the fruit? I can't think of the name of it, but um, allows you to... Add songs to your iPod, Apple iPod. And I like GTK Pod because it's just a standalone application, does all the things right out of the box. But that's no longer, they're not maintaining it anymore. And so it works just fine on the Ubuntu LTS, does not work on Arch. But again, I would tell you that's not really Arch's fault. It's just a function of living on the edge. You find out where all the bones are buried before the rest of the world figures out where all the bones are buried. From the Linux Newswire Newsroom, this is the Week in Review with JT. For the week of January 21st, 2024, here's the Linux and open source news. KVRC 5.2, codenamed Quasar, has been released. Firefox 122 is out. The fifth patch set to Proton 8 is out, and it brings more HDR gaming to Linux as well as a lot of fixes. The Fish Shell 3.7 has been released. Pulse Audio 17 is out. Wine 9.0 is out and brings improved Windows and game compatibility to Linux. In distro news, the SteamOS alternative Bazite 2.2 is out. Sparky Linux 2024.01 has been released. AV Linux 23.1, codenamed Enlighten, has been released, which is based on Debian 11. 
the Edge ISO is now available for Linux Mint 21.3. MX Linux 23.2 Liberetto, which is based on Debian 12.4, has been released with the Linux 6.6 kernel and Pipewire 1.0. And BPF updates have opened the door to Linux extensible scheduling. In security news, over the past month, members of the Hunter Bug Bounty Platform for Artificial Intelligence and Machine Learning have identified multiple severe vulnerabilities in popular solutions such as MLflow, ClearML, and Hug and Face. And lastly, in other AI news, Mark Zuckerberg has claimed that Facebook is planning on developing an AGI, an Artificial General Intelligence, and then plans to release it as open source software for everyone. So I'm on the way home from uh, giving my kid a ride home from school. And as we're in the car, we I, I'm trying to find a way to connect uh, with this kid. And I start asking him, you know, what are you interested? In? What are you going to do when you get home? And I find out oh, he's really into gaming, really likes Xbox. And so I start poking around. Hey, do you ever have you ever done PC gaming? No, but I'm really interested in it. I said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm thinking that I'm going to get there eventually. I said, OK, great. So. I, I start asking him, what have you looked at? What are you thinking about? And he tells me, well, I've been looking at building a gaming computer. And I said, well, I own an IT company. If you ever need any help, you let me know. Unbeknownst to me, he goes to his mother and is like, I, you know, I want his help. I, I is over the moon. So his mother reaches out to my wife and says, this kid is over the moon. He really wants to come over to your house. He wants to do all the things. And he wants to know what parts you have, how he can get into to it, learn about it, all the things. And I said, well, why don't you come over and we'll see, we'll, we'll learn together. So he comes over and he has two machines that he had picked out on Amazon, custom gaming machines. They were between like $600 and almost 800 bucks. And he said, are these good gaming machines? I look at them. I five 32 gigs of Ram. That's sort of dedicated graphics. All the things I said, yeah, they're great. Do you have, yep. Do you have, do you have 750 bucks? You have $800? Well, no. It's okay. So what do you have or what is your budget? Well, get about $100 for my birthday and $100 for Christmas. So, all right. So the rest of your life, you're going to have to decide what portion of your income you're going to allocate towards gaming. And it's a fool's errand to say, well, I'm just going to buy the best thing. There'll always be a better thing. And even if you have the best thing, the next day, there's going to be a better thing. And you'll chase that dragon till the cows come home. Don't fall for that trap. So I said, I have some machines. Why don't you look at them and see if they meet your needs? So I pull a bunch of machines out. I think I had a, a, a Xeon, a, a quad core Xeon. I had a Ryzen machine and I had an i5, I believe. And he looks at it and he immediately gravitates to the Ryzen machine. I believe because of the aesthetics, it was an HP had like a carbon fiber looking case. And he goes, what do you think of this one? I said, that's the newest one. So it's probably a really decent machine but it's still from like 2017. And oh, by the way, when it came out, it was a business computer. It really wasn't designed to be a gaming machine. However, it might be a really great base to start building a gaming machine. So we go, we open the machine up and we pull everything out. We find some RAM, put it in. We get him an SSD. We put it in. He's connected every everything. He's able to identify the parts. He understands what's going on. And then we get it connected to a monitor. I said, well, what do you want to put on it? He goes, what do you mean? I said, well, you got a hardware. It all functions. But you got no software. You got to install something. Well, how do I get Windows? Well, spend two hundred dollars. Wait a few days in the mail. They'll send you a thing. Then we'll install it. Then we got to activate it. And then if all that goes well, and after we install the drivers, a few hours later, you'll be able to use it. Well, two hundred. That's a lot of money. Yeah, it is. Was there anything else I could do? I'm glad you asked. So, a few hours later, we get Kubuntu set up. We get Steam set up. We install the games. He's playing the games, and I look over at him like, "Hey." Does this qualify as a gaming machine? Does it get you where you need to be? Yeah, this is fantastic. I never thought in a million years I'd be able to leave here with a computer. I thought I was just coming over to learn about some computer parts and figure out what I was going to order, save up some money over the next few years. And a couple of lessons, I guess, drove drove home for me. One is I think it's a sad state of affairs the way that kids experience technology because they largely walk around this earth looking at what technology can do for them as opposed to what they can do with technology. They've given up being the master of the technology and accepted that the technology makes the decisions and then they are to conform. Oh, this is the way the company says I'm supposed to do it. Oh, this is what I'm allowed to do. Oh, this is what I'm not allowed to do rather than what is the hardware capable. So that was my, that was my first takeaway and that was a bit of a disappointment. Second thing is 
before the world has contaminated people with the, well, you have to have apple. If it's not an apple and doesn't have a half-eaten fruit on the back, it's just not a quality. If you can get to them before that happens, the preconceived notion is just that I want to use this thing. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care what you call it. And so when we're able to install Steam, right-click on the games that he wants, compatibility, force compatibility, launch, Bob's your uncle, you're in the game. That's a good experience. That's a good experience for somebody who's just learning how to explore technology. Now, simultaneously, while I'm having this, what I would consider to be a fairly successful interaction with this young man, Steve sends me a link. And it's a very in-depth study on the silent epi uh, epidemic of people being buried inside of their screens and the damage that comes from excessive screen usage. Quote, Excessive screen uses have become an epidemic silently ending lives with little resistance. Gallup's survey found that around 60% of young adults admit to spending too much time on the Internet. In a subsequent survey, 83% of smartphone users said that they kept their phones near them almost all the time during waking hours. Excessive use of screens has become an epidemic. Sorry. People sp spend a lot of time outside of work are typically enjoying short videos, film, television, social media, and video games. All of these screen-based forms of entertainment offer a similar emotional experience of novelty, discovery, and instant reward. The process is both stressful and satisfying at the same time. Now, here's the part that really gets me, Steve. Between 2005 and 2012, the change in rates of depressive episodes from teens 12 to 17 barely touched 1%, or just over 1%. So think about that. You're talking about the formative years. You're talking about kids that are coming out of middle school, going into middle, or excuse me, coming out of elementary school, going into middle school, right up until the time they're leaving high school. And we barely touched 1%. That's all the way from 2005 to 2012. 2012, smartphones are becoming more prolific. Services are becoming more prolific. Social media is becoming an expected social norm. And now all of a sudden, between 2012 and 2017, there's a 4% increase. So we went from barely over 1% to a little over four in what? Five years? That's terrifying. It's just getting worse too. That, that's the other thing we have. Uh, so I, I was having a conversation with a, a young lady who's significantly younger than I am, like was two years old when I was in university. <laughs> younger. And, and she was talking about how we were talking about things that you wouldn't want to to live without and i told her you know like the computer is really important to me but if i had to choose between the computer and being able to work outside i'd be able to, like i i take working outside all the time and she countered with uh, i always need my tablet and so what I does one that, do with a tablet outside exactly whatever i mean if you've got one of those apple ones that's got the lte you've got the internet wherever you are essentially and right. Um, I, I assume, but I have no idea that she was an Apple user and it just, it just struck me like that's normal and that's okay. And there's, there's not anything seen to be wrong with that. And I think how much has it changed from 2017 to 2024, having gone through COVID and everything else? I think a lot, right? I think our expectation changed because, so here's the thing. And I, I, this is something I will never be able to unsee. It's one of those things that got stuck in my head. And now, now I'm now I'm like poisoned. I watched as my at the time kindergartner. You know, we set up a room. We took a room in our house and we set it up and said, "Okay, the kids are going to be at school." I tell you what's not going to happen. They're not going to set up at school in my office because I need to be able to get work done too. And all of a sudden, my wife and I are adjusting to being at home, and the kids are home all day and all the things. And we're becoming fill-in school teachers. It was a mess. So we set up an entire room. And the other thing was I didn't really want school devices and school cameras and all the things all over my house. They don't need to be there. So we set up a dedicated room. We put all the kids in there, set up all the devices there. And I walk in to go, you know, checking every 20, 30 minutes, you know, do you need a snack? Do you need a water bathroom break? Whatever. And I come in and I notice when I set my kindergartner down at 820 in the morning, there was this little girl connected and she's in her jammies, clearly in her bed with her blanket up, a bag of pretzels over to her right. And she's connected to the Zoom meeting. So at first, I first see it and I'm thinking to myself, well, maybe she climbed back into bed or maybe she hadn't really gotten up yet or maybe, I don't know. But as I come in at noon and as I come in at two and finally when they're getting out at three, this little girl, same spot, same bed, same jammies, same bag of pretzels, right? Well, less pretzels, but same bag of pretzels. Never once 
in the entire however long we were doing the remote learning thing, did I ever see an adult come into that room, check on her, ask her how things are going, give her food? And it, we, we, exp we just, we changed as a society. We changed, and I don't know for the better, but we just decided we were going to do these things because we had to be able to accommodate or do these things to try to keep people safe. And so we did the best we could. But at the end of the day, human beings are not designed to live behind screens. And they're definitely not designed to interact with other people only behind screens. It can be an auxiliary way to stay in contact with people, but it isn't the primary way we're designed to interface. There's a lot of uh, psychology out there that talks about how even, even behind a screen and you know the person the behavior goes off the rails. It, there's just something about being in person that changes the way your physiology works towards mm. the other person, like in terms of you can down to the idea of pheromones, and I'm not even talking about any kind of attraction, just picking up on this person's angry or not without reading the, the facial expressions, right? There's a bunch of cues that you get being in person that... Um, disappear online not only that um I, I was reading about how this has changed the way people are interacting from the standpoint of like i'm just going to hang up on you and then i'm not going to answer your call until you think about what you've done which you can't really do if you're in person like you can storm off but you can't just end the conversation by closing the laptop lid or something like that and that breeds all kinds of bad behavior it does. And to include people like this is this is a thing that's like I had to have one of the younger people from my company explain this to me because it was completely it was so lost on me. It was one of those new cultural things that I'm like, I don't understand. Explain it to me again. Use l l smaller words and talk slower. Apparently, it is a thing now. If you go to apply for a job and you apply for a job and somebody says, Steve, I will give you this job. Here's the wage. Here's the day you start. And you say, OK, Noah, I'll be there at that day for that wage and I will start. And you don't come in that day where you say you're going to, and I reach out to you and I go, hey man, I thought you were starting on this day. Are you coming in for this wage like we discussed in the contract that you assigned? You don't have to get back to me. In fact, you never have to talk to me again. You just go about your life as if we, you never made that commitment, as if we never had that conversation, as if there wasn't an agreement in place and you can go apply to other places or you can go do other things and that is to be accepted because it's just, oh, you just got ghosted, that's all. And the yeah. first time somebody explained that to me, I'm like, S I, you're going to have, what? At, like, n at, no pro at, at no point is there a, so I'm going to, wait, listen, man, we got to get together and talk. Yeah, I get a cup of coffee, something like that, sit down across from one another. Hey, I'm really sorry. I know that we agreed on X, Y, Z, but Z came up. I can't turn it down. I won't turn it down. I'm not, whatever it is, you have the intestinal fortitude to look the other person in the eye and explain why it is you're not going to be able to fulfill the commitment that you said you were going to be able to fulfill. And yeah. We've just yep. given up on that. It's it, so this extended uh, use of screens has actually increased a ton of psychological disorders, including dissociative disorder, which which is linked with what you're just talking about, mm. where you're so detached from the idea of the other person's human feelings and emotions and whatever, because you're not connected with them, that it's just OK to completely disregard and have no uh, no real social ability to um, be a decent human being in mm. that case. Yeah, I'm, you're either on blast or you're canceled. That's uh, So anyway, all that to say, it's a ripping good read. We'll have it link for you in the show notes, podcast.asknowshow.com. Highly recommend you check it out. And if you have kids, pay attention to the subject. Pay attention to the research that's out there and make appropriate decisions. I'm not telling you I know what they are for you or your kid, but I'm just suggesting that you be aware of the research that's out there and make good decisions. Firefox is launching as a deb. Great news for Linux users after months of testing. Mozilla released today a new package for Firefox on Linux, specifically Ubuntu or Debian-based distributions. If you've not heard of Linux, which is known for its open source software and alternative to traditional operating systems, or are curious to learn more, here are four reasons why you should give the Firefox Linux package a new try, and then they go through them. This is the thing that caught my eye, Steve. Browsers are complex applications that support many scenarios in people's daily lives. We've been working to improve sandbox implementations. This is why, and here's the catchy part, while Firefox gets fully compatible with Snap and Flatpak, we want to offer a native package too. If I'm reading between the lines, I am to believe that Mozilla tells me 
by shipping their own PPA and their own deb, they're going to get better performance and faster update. Well, I'm confused now because I thought that's what Snap was all about. You push to the repo and it automatically rebuilds. You push to the repo and Snap's by default are going to check for updates every six hours. So it's super easy for the developer and easy for them. One place, sensor source of truth, all the things gets up to date, stays up to date. And yet they're going back to a deb. I have to wonder why that is. And if you read the article and read between the lines, I think th what I take from it is that it's not quite there yet with these sandbox style applications. And so they're going back to a deb via a PPA. And now when Firefox releases the latest version, you'll get a nice native packaged browser. What do you think? I think that it's increasingly difficult to change the way that you architect something. So when you mm. think about these sandboxed applications, you're, you're fundamentally thinking about Linux namespaces or similar ideas. And when you take a an application that hasn't been built with this in mind and try and plunk it on top, man, are you gonna hit edge cases? It, like, it might work and it might launch and it might look okay, mm -hmm. but with enough people banging on it, you're going to have edge cases you didn't necessarily consider because you've lifted an old architecture and tried to apply it to a new thing. We, we struggled with this when we first started seeing containers and masks um, from various vendors. It's mm -hmm. like they'd pick up their monolith application, plunk it in a container and be like, good, we're done. Here's a 17 gig, gig container. And you're like, mm, that's not exactly how that works. I think they'll figure it out. I just think that, uh, like all things, when you take something that was designed with no restrictions in mind, like the traditional Linux system doesn't really have a ton of restrictions in mind in terms of the way that that works compared to sandboxing. And then you try and apply a bunch of things. Mm -hmm. It's like taking something that hasn't been tested on AppArmor or SE Linux and then turning them on and then being like, why did why it break? It yeah. Yeah. So anyway, I, you take what you, I mean, you, the listener, take from that what you like, but I, I see it as a good sign. I think it's pretty cool. And I'm super happy to have native Firefox back because I was real tired of waiting for things to launch. So matrix.org has an open letter to the CSA. Now, a number of organizations have signed on to this to include Proton, NextCloud, Tuta, and obviously Element and the Matrix Foundation themselves. And effectively, what they're fighting against is the CSA. And so they, they specify that they know that looking for specific content such as text, photos, videos in end-to-end -end encrypted communications requires a backdoor. There's no other way to do it. And so they say that, hey, if you're doing this, you're potentially allowing criminals to access the same technology. The other thing that I thought was interesting in this letter, the EU sees itself as a brand differentiator by being focused on data privacy and securing applications. So they want to make sure that the council's position is aligned as closely as possible with the European Parliament. And they lay out step by step why this is best case scenario and why this is best practice and why these companies should take this seriously. I invite you to read the entire thing. It's a rip and good read. Again, we'll have links for you in the show notes, podcast.astoashow.com. AV Linux, this is a addition based on Debian specifically for doing production stuff. And I have to tell you, I watched the 87 minute uh, video walkthrough that kind of walks you through how to get everything set up. It's real cool. And there's a call to action here. Music nerds unite. I want you to write in live at asknoshow.com. What are you using Linux for? We're going to have a future music episode. Robin Garris from Ardour will join us. And I'm going to invite a couple of other people in the community that have been doing some music production on Linux, we'll talk about it. But I'd like to hear your thoughts live at asknoshow.com. Music in your ears means we're out of time. We'll see you next week, 6 p.m. Tuesday, asknoshow.com.